Well, we might begin, so to welcome everyone. And as we have done in, in other weeks, I'm just going to begin with a short uh, visualisation meditation, which is also doubling as the motivation for the session. So we, in the crown, above our crowns, we visualise a multicoloured lotus. with our uh, moon and sun cushions upon which is seated Shakyamuni Buddha, inseparable from our holy teachers. Inside Guru Shakyamuni Buddha's heart, we visualize Vajradhara, the tantric manifestation of the guru. And inside Vajradhara's heart, we visualize the seed syllable hung in blue form. Not visualizing the Sanskrit mantra, we can syllable, we can visualize an intense, pure, radiant bead of blue light. And just spend a, a few moments calming the mind by letting go of any extraneous thought processes with the out breath and then breathing in clear, open, flexible mind. So also any illnesses can leave with the out breath. Breathing the opposite healing radiant light which saturates even down to the finest molecule of the body pervades our mind we recite the refuge prayer I and I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the highest assembly. And the virtuous merit that I collect by practicing giving and the other perfections may attain the state of a Buddha in order to be able to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the highest assembly. From the virtuous merit that I collect, by practicing giving and other perfections, may I attain the state of a Buddha to be able to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the highest assembly. From the virtuous merit that I collect by practicing giving and the other perfections, may I attain the state of a Buddha to be able to benefit all sentient beings. Offering the Brief mandala. By the virtue of offering to you, assembly of Buddhas, visualize before me this mandala built on a base resplendent with flowers, saffron water, and incense, adorned with Mount Meru and the four continents, as well as the sun and the moon. May all sentient beings share in its good effects. Idam Guru Ratna Mandala Kam Niri And the seven limb prayer. I prostrate with body, speech, and mind in faith. Each and every offering I make, including those really performed and those mentally transformed, I confess every negativity collected from the beginninglessness of samsaric life. I rejoice in all ordinary and noble beings' actions. Please, Guru Buddha, by living as our guide until samsara ends, Reveal the teachings to sentient beings. I dedicate the virtue of myself and others to the great enlightenment. And I'm now going to recite the planting the stake prayer again, as we did last week. And as this prayer, each verse, imagine that waves of radiant light and nectar in the five colours pour 
into our, our body and particularly our, our subtle body and our various chakras and so forth and completely infuses us uh, with the blessings of, of Shakyamuni Guru Buddha. Embodiment of the four bodies, Guru Supreme Deity, to Shakyamuni Vajradhara, I make requests. Embodiment of the truth body, free of obscurations, Guru Supreme Deity, to Shakyamuni Vajradhara, I make requests. Embodiment of the great bliss enjoyment body, Guru Supreme Deity, to Shakyamuni Vajradhara, I make requests. Embodiment of the various emanation bodies, Guru Supreme Deity, to Shakyamuni Vajradhara, I make requests. Embodiment of all Gurus, Guru Supreme Deity, to Shakyamuni Vajradhara, I make requests. Embodiment of all meditational deities, Guru Supreme Deity, to Shakyamuni Vajradhara, I make requests. Embodiment of all Buddhas, Guru Supreme Deity, to Shakyamuni Vajradhara, I make requests. Embodiment of all Holy Dharma, Guru Supreme Deity, to Shakyamuni Vajradhara, I make requests. Embodiment of all Sangha, Guru Supreme Deity, to Shakyamuni Vajradhara, I make requests. Embodiment of all Dakinis, Guru Supreme Deity, to Shakyamuni Vajradhara, I make requests. Embodiment of all Dharma protectors, Guru Supreme Deity, to Shakyamuni Vajradhara, I make requests. Embodiment of all Dharma protectors, Guru Supreme Deity, to Shakyamuni Vajradhara, I make requests. In particular, I beseech all mother sentient beings and I have been born in samsara and have endured a host of intense sufferings over a long time. This is the result of not relying properly upon the spiritual teacher in both thought and deed. Therefore, Guru Deity, Please bless me and all mother sentient beings to now rely properly upon the spiritual teacher in both thought and deed. So we also visualize that the radiant light and nectars pour out not just to ourselves through our crown, but enter the crowns of all other beings in the countless universes, blessing their continuums. So they also become inseparable from Shakyamuni Buddha, inseparable from our guru. So we'll leave the visualization there. And that, that's a very uh, concentrated meditation, but it's also a very complete meditation. And, and of course, we can add our own supplications so that at the end of that prayer, you might like to spend some more moments in your own meditation time, um, sort of making personal requests, maybe have dilemmas and things happening in your life. So it can be very much targeted to deal with the actual situations that are arising around us. And we can also do the practice on behalf of others. So if you know someone who's sick, we can particularly visualize Shakyamuni Buddha, separate from our guru of their crown and visualize the light pouring directly into them. So Kabje Zopa Rinpoche, because we're we're basing the, this, these talks on on Kabje Zopa Rinpoche's uh, very very beautiful and very moving book, The Heart of the Path, and in that on page three, Kabje Zopa Rinpoche says the Guru's blessings transform our mind from being hard and unsubdued into being soft and subdued. Even from our own experiences, we can tell that what the teachings say about the blessings of the guru is true and have complete faith in it. And Rinpoche continues, when we have strong meditational experiences, ones that change our mind, we feel even more deeply 
the kindness of the virtuous friend and develop more devotion towards them. That developing realizations depends upon guru devotion it is not simply something made up so that gurus receive more respect, service, and offerings. We clearly see the truth from our own of this from our own experiences. So this is really very clearly an, an invitation to us to establish this personal relationship. And the result, uh, the benefit of this visualization is that it's one that we can invoke and carry around with us throughout the course of our daily activities. And uh, as my, my teacher Keshi Doga says, we also visualize, particularly at the time of going to sleep, and then receive the blessings and then absorb the visualization into our subtle mind at the heart and go to sleep based on this uh, absorption, if you like, into enlightened uh, energy. And so this really uh, transforms the experience of sleep as well. And then when we arise in the morning, we create, re-establish the visualization and arise on that basis. So it's it becomes a very uh, personal and um, intimate uh, process. So I'm now going to move on, as I, I mentioned last week, to cover at least a broach, if you like, the fundamental, the guru in terms of being the fundamental ground upon which to establish our, our faith. So to quote Kabje Zopa Rinpoche on page 25 of our text, among all the many different qualities to consider in choosing a guru, the fundamental thing is to examine whether or not the person emphasizes the practices of morality or ethics. As described in the first verse of the requesting prayer in the Guru Puja, it's verse 25, if you're interested in following that up, the fundamental point, according to Lama Sankarpa's teaching, is living in the morality of ordination. However, whether the virtuous teacher is lay or ordained, the basic quality is that he or she should live in morality and emphasize the practice of morality, because otherwise there is no basis for realization. Disciples who don't practice morality, which means protecting karma, can't achieve even the happiness of a good rebirth in their next life, let alone liberation from samsara. Just as you can't hold liquid without a container, you can't receive the body of a happy migratory being, a deva or a human, in your next life without living in morality. Without the practice of morality, you can't even be protected from the lower realms. If the guru is someone who emphasizes morality, he or she is able to protect the disciple from negative karma the obstacle to achieve enlightenment, liberation, and the happiness of future lives. The disciple is then able to achieve temporary and ultimate happiness. So this is really, really uh, important, isn't it? The fundamental ground of our practice of, of guru devotion and our way of approaching it more intimately is through the practice of ethics ourselves. And as Rinpoche is describing so vividly, as our practice of ethics is enhanced, as we gain more ability to subdue our wild mind and control what's coming out of our three doors, uh, we realize more and more the qualities of the guru. And this is because our mind is becoming purer and more pacified. And because of that, we're not as hindered and, strang and strangled by our very short term obsessive thinking to do with seeking the pleasures and fulfillments of this one lifetime. And so this is where the bodhicitta motivation uh, is so important too, because that's the reason as a Mahayana practitioner that we're practicing uh, ethics. It's to secure a, fa a fundamental basis in a precious human rebirth from which we can continue to practice 
more and more deeply and profoundly in order to reach and benefit more and more sentient beings as we progress. And as that happens, we leave behind the uh, often very brittle and, and even dangerous edifice of the self-cherishing mind, that mind that has dominated our behaviours for countless rebirths. And so visualising the guru in, in a very real way provides an, a, a radical interruption to this obsession of clinging to I, 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 I. As soon as we see something attractive, we think I, mine, I want, I shall get, so forth. That is so powerful. And so we're sort of circumventing that uh, pattern, that obsessive structure by opening up the guru visualisation as a doorway, as Rinpoche describes in the book, to higher qualities ones that we're able to develop ourselves. So it's incredibly inspirational and incredibly personal. So Rinpoche gives essential advice on, on the quality of the guru in these terms. He says, although the texts explain all these many different qualities, this is on page 50, to look for in a guru, the very essence is that a guru should at least be someone who emphasizes cherishing others more than cherishing self, because we then have the opportunity to develop bodhicitta, the root of the Mahayana path, and thus achieve enlightenment. Otherwise, if our guru doesn't emphasize cherishing ourselves, or cherishing others, we will cherish ourselves, and we'll have no opportunity to develop bodhicitta. In essence, we should choose as our guru someone who emphasizes cherishing others through the practices of loving kindness, compassion, and bodhicitta. Failing that, choose a spiritual teacher who emphasizes liberation from samsara rather than samsaric pleasures, because these keep us entrapped in the immediate stranglehold of our obsessive craving. And if a virtue, yes, um, and emphasize it, of course, then we have ourselves an opportunity to strive for liberation. And then, Ribeche says, at the very least, choose a spiritual master who regards working for the happiness of future lives as more important than working for the happiness of this life. If our spiritual teacher doesn't emphasize this, he or she can't guide us even in the path of happiness to future lives, which means a good rebirth. If aimed only at the happiness of this life, our practice won't even become holy dharma. So I noticed in that uh, very brief, succinct description that Rinpoche is also covering the three um, sort of... Uh, levels, if you like, of practice according to the three scopes of the path the lum, as presented in the Lum Rim. And so, as we know, in the first scope, in order to even qualify as a Dharma practitioner, we have to surrender craving fulfillment with the pleasures of this life. That's the minimum requirement to begin to practice. So that's equivalent to um, developing renunciation um, for the pleasures of this life. We then focus on 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 uh, future lives, thinking how wonderful to have happiness in future lives. But if that's for our own purposes exclusively, then we leave all other suffering mother sentient beings behind. Which, as Pavon Rinpoche says so beautifully in Liberation of the Palm of, the, of Your Hand, it's like watching our precious mother being washed away in a flood, and she reaches out her hand and as she goes past and we make no effort to reach over and to hold it. We're, we're forfeiting that care, even for a, a one being, in this case, our, our precious mother. So that becomes the epitome of the problem of only seeking our own pleasures in future lives. So we, we try to go beyond seeking liberation, which is the practice of the second scope, and then enter the third scope, the path of the Bodhisattva. And so for this, we very much need a guru who's motivated by uh, bodhicitta because they'll then be able to impart all of the qualities and, and practices connect, connected to the six perfections. 
So there's a summary for the qualities of the guru, which is, is famously given in the Lamrim, and his Holiness the Dalai Lama frequently quotes this verse in large public teachings, and it comes from Ornament of the Mahayana Sutras by Maitreya Buddha, and it lists 10 qualities of the virtuous friend uh, that should be present in order to reveal the Mahayana teachings. And I quote, relying upon a virtuous friend who is subdued, pacified, and highly pacified, has greater knowledge, has perseverance, is learned in scripture, has realized emptiness, is skillful in teaching, has a compassionate mind, and has abandoned discouragement. So if we want to investigate this further, we can refer to pages 32 to 33 of, of the text. Um, and Rinpoche gives a kind of a elaboration of, of the terms, and he mentions that subdued in this context refers to uh, that a guru should be living in the higher training of morality, protecting themselves from negative karma. Even a lay teacher should be living in the lay preta moksha vows. So in this sense, even a lay practitioner can be ordained. So let's get back to that early point that was made. In that way, they will be learned or subdued. The actions of their body, speech, and mind, in other words, uh, will be motivated by pure compassion. Pacified means that on top of that, the guru should have trained in the higher training of concentration because by developing shamatha or single-pointed concentration, we have the ability to at least temporarily suppress the arising of the manifest afflictions. So it becomes a very, very powerful tool for beginning uh, to develop not only great insight into the nature of reality, but also to begin creating some separation between ourselves and the kind of obsessive uh, self-seeking that has strangled, held us for so long. Highly pacified, Rinpoche says, relates to the high training of wisdom or great insight. And even if this is not referring to the highest view, which is the Prasangika view, uh, it has to, you know, at least it's referring uh, to the mind only school or one of the lower schools. So we're looking here at a special mind of wisdom that's correctly penetrating the nature of reality. And that can be enhanced on the path. Greater knowledge um, is referring to the fact that the, the teacher, the guru, should, should have greater realize or greater more realizations than, than the student does. So I can't have to claim to have any greater realizations than you here. I don't regard you as students. I regard you as my, my Dharma friends. But it's interesting to consider here that to be a really effective guru, one would need to have more knowledge than the student. Otherwise, how can they expand the student's awareness? So I don't think I need to elaborate that point more. Perseverance means perseverance. Don't give up. And this is really important, isn't it? Because I, I think when the, the Tibetan teachers first came to the West, there was you know, an initial flurry of great excitement and, and incredible cultural exchange. And then the nitty gritty of, of looking at what was involved in beginning to practice as, as a Buddhist, maybe in a non-Buddhist environment in some cases, began to hit. And many students drifted away uh, in dismay or, or lack of interest and so forth, or they were seeking something better somewhere else. And so what's remarkable about our teachers is that they're there again the next day for us, no matter what we've done or haven't done. It's like a, a beautiful parent again. It doesn't matter what the child's done. They're going to be there to pick the child up the next time they fall over and hurt themselves, irrespective of what the child has just said or done. And so there's this sort of incredible commitment to the long term, which, which carries us away from being prejudged according to very limited criteria. And I feel this is really important from a, a psychological point of view because so many Westerners, as we know, are haunted uh, by feelings of 
inferiority and and so forth and self-denigration is a really powerful problem for many many people and so the context for that kind of intense self-regard can be relaxed because we don't have to panic that if we're not good enough somehow our guru is going to walk away and abandon us and that might have happened to us in many of our other relationships we might have in fact have annoyed and pissed off lots of other people who have in fact abandoned us but even if we treat our guru sort of inappropriately from their side as someone who's who's a pure manifestation of of bodhicitta they won't reject you in fact if anything they'll be more concerned to reach out and help there's a very beautiful image isn't there of the buddha being anointed on one side by someone with beautiful her, you know herbs and and uh, perfumes and on the other side being attacked by someone with a knife and it said that the buddha has perfect spontaneous equanimity towards those two beings the buddha cares for both of those beings with the same pure concern totally uninfluenced by the degree of or aspect of the behavior that's being manifested and that's how deep their compassion is so i find this incredibly inspiring to think about how how deep the guru's compassion can be so being learned in scriptures pretty obvious again we not, wouldn't go to school if our teachers knew less than we did and compassion itself without compassion says even a teacher with great knowledge won't necessarily be able to help the disciple. And so there are some very moving accounts we find in, in the, um, the literature of uh, very highly realized teachers in their own right having incredible, profound respect for their teacher who might have been a very hum apparently a very humble practitioner and maybe they weren't vastly learned but they had this incredible quality of love and compassion and impartiality and because of that incredible development of those qualities they are perfect reliable objects of refuge of, of, of seeking refuge in so again someone can be very are kind of brilliant, if you like, or or um, impressive academically, and so you know all these qualities we can be hoodwinked by, but Rinpoche is really inviting us here to, to look more deeply at the the inner qualities of the person. If we see our teacher give a, a beautiful discourse in front of a thousand people and then kick the cat on the way out of the gompa, I'm giving a really extreme example. We have very serious grounds to rethink the situation, don't we? So if kindness and compassion are lacking, all of those other qualities become twisted and, and, and in a sense, alive. So having abandoned discouragement, Rinpoche says, the other quality means uh, the teacher should abandon impatience, exhaustion, and laziness in guiding disciples. They shouldn't uh, be discouraged or upset when teaching the Dharma. And if the guru has compassion, there is no thought of laziness or laziness in, in guiding them. So Rinpoche then asks a very important question. Uh, what happens if we can't find all of these 10 qualities intact in a single person? And so Rinpoche says, quote, Although these 10 qualities are mentioned in the or ornament of Mahayana Sutras, Geshe Potawa said, even if the guru doesn't have all these qualities, he should at least have the following five. The realization of emptiness, compassion, greater understanding and qualities than the disciple, pure moral conduct, and no discouragement when teaching disciples. Otherwise, the teacher cannot guide the disciple out of samsara. Um, the Lama Zopa now uh, 
introduces the qualities required of a, of a tantric guru because this is on top or if you like in addition to the qualities of a mahayana guru it's not that a tantric guru isn't a mahayana guru but in addition to being a mahayana guru they're doing particular practices that require uh, very very subtle yogas and so forth and so there are uh, way of communicating with their students uh, can often be different. It will be more emphasizing tantric uh, ritual visualization, uh, sadhanas and so forth. So Rinpoche uh, quotes the 50 verses of guru devotion where the qualities of the tantric guru are described. Firm and subdued, intelligent, patient, sincere, without cunning, knowledgeable in mantras, and the various activities of Tantra, compassionate and loving, learned in the scriptures, proficient in the ten principles, expert in drawing mandalas, skilled in explaining Tantric teachings, calm with subdued senses. Rinpoche refers to the uh, verse 43 in the Guru Puja as, as a kind of encapsulation of these qualities. You are patient, wise, patient, honest, without pretense or guile. Your three doors well subdued. You have both sets of ten qualities, no tantra and its rituals, and are skilled in drawing and explaining. Foremost, hold, Vajra Holder, I make request to you. So Lama Kapa gives three essential qualities of the Vajra Guru. First, he should have received the full initiation of the deity and be living well in the, in the samayas of his or her ordinations. Second, he should know the ten or she should know the ten principles and be expert in the principles of giving initiations through having seen the traditional practices of the lineage lamas. So in other words, the Tantric guru has received pure lineages themselves and is therefore qualified to pass them on. And a Vajrayana guru should be skilled in drawing the various protection mandalas and so forth, and also be expert in, in the tantric uh, recitations and their meanings. So these qualities are going to be elaborated, but they're going to be a particular interest to those students who are wishing uh, to do tantric practice as a main daily activity and are particularly uh, critical for those who may be wishing to take what's referred to as a highest yoga tantra initiation or even uh, a yoga tantra initiation where tantric vows are received at the beginning of the initiation and become part of the requisite receiving initiation. So that sets up a very particular karmic relationship. Now, are there any sort of questions about that before we move on? Yeah, Doris. First, I'd like to welcome Mummy Max. And- Hello. <laughs> So my question is, how do you establish that somebody's realized emptiness? If they don't go around uh, advertising that, so how do we deal with that? It's, a, it's an interesting question, isn't it? I think we could only, you know, for an ordinary person, we could only do that on the basis of having some um, experience of their, their teachings on, on the path. And so if they begin to espouse some strange ideas about emptiness one would be in a position to challenge them, debate them, I would think, and uh, compare them to, to what we have all already learned. So I think this is why Rinpoche is emphasising ethics so strongly at the beginning, because we're still on safe ground, aren't we? <laughs> As we deepen that relationship, their understanding of emptiness uh, becomes really, really important because it's going to be indispensable in guiding us along the path and so we've got more opportunities of seeing the teacher's um, qualifications his holiness on this point often says that in these sorts of situations simply 
um, trust a Geshe, for example, because they it's definite that their thorough training in the monastic syllabus will have uh, given them the opportunity to uh, have developed a sound understanding. They wouldn't have got the qualification otherwise because they're so strenuously uh, assessed in, in rigorous debate by the top in minds within the monastic setting. And so there's no one who can creep through that gruelling examination process and come out the other side with, with a misunderstanding of emptiness. So, um, yes, it's an interesting question. Some of these qualities are difficult for us, us to determine. And I think, too, um, intuition is, is important here, too. But, you know, we get a sense that someone is, is, is virtuous by watching them and, and feeling how they behave. So I don't think we should distrust that kind of gut feeling um, as well. And so I think we need a combination of, of qualities. I might ask anyone else to offer their answers for that because it's a very uh, interesting question. Some of the students here are, are uh, more experienced than I am, so. Dr. Moore, I don't have a, I don't have an answer for that, but I have another question. Yes. And that is, how, how do you maintain equanimity if you are being attacked by either another person or by the state itself? So being attacked. Being attacked. The very, the very core of your being. Maybe you're being physically attacked by another person. Yeah. Or you are being attacked by the state in some fundamental way. Oh, but I didn't get the second part. Sorry. By the, the state. By the state. Oh, itself. the state. The state. Yes. Mm. Um, that's a, again, a, it's a very big question. I, I think myself that the fundamental qualities of love and compassion are absolutely vital here. And when it comes to resistance um, uh, or activism, if you like, if it's based on love and compassion, then I think you can afford to be very, very dynamic and very vigorous. If your activism is based on a kind of self-cherishing that the rest of the world has to somehow conform to my point of view and I'm going to kill you or get angry with you if you don't agree, then we're in trouble because we're never going to be able to surmount or uh, remove the enemy under those circumstances. And so uh, it takes a very careful manoeuvring for an act, any form of activism, I think, so that we don't uh, egotize and make the, the cause something that's so closely bound to ourselves that we can't bear it not to be fulfilled. We have to be practical and open and at the same time very skillful. Uh, the, the French philosopher Michel Foucault had a, a really interesting idea here. He, he talked about micro politics and he's, he suggested um, being very skillful in the given moment and then stepping back, re-sorting yourself, re-clarifying the situation, and then deciding to step in again in, in a skillful manner. And so it becomes a more strategic kind of dynamic coming and going of our activism. And in the process, we've got time to be working on ourselves and, and improving our, our quality of assessment from our side as well. It's, um, and I, I gave my own story about being being attacked when I was um, gay bashed in the uh, Wheel of Sharp Weapons uh, teachings. And I, I practiced Ton Len because for me, that was the, the perfect way of, of navigating the immediate aftermath of the attack. And when I approached Geshe Doga about the fact that I, I hadn't allowed myself to be killed, I just say, oh, it's okay to be killed. I won't fight back. I didn't fight as such. I responded. <laughs> and I responded, as I mentioned, by jumping up and spinning. And I don't know where that spinning came from. It was some primordial survival instinct kicked in. 
And it wasn't aimed to wound or kill the assailant. It was simply to disconnect the vulnerability that I was in at that very moment because I had a knife held to my throat and had to do something. And so I discovered in retrospect, when the, because the police investigated, that the knife was found at the scene. It had been kicked or some dislodged from the assailant's hand. And um, there was no remnants of them, unfortunately, in the sense that they were never caught. So I did Ton Len um, standing, um, bleeding. I had a broken arm and so forth, broken nose. I, was, I was, had been bashed. And I just stood there doing Ton Len. And it was the most powerful practice of Ton Len I've ever done. Because I was thinking, may all the suffering of all sentient beings, without exception, ripen on me this instant. And because I was in so much pain, it had enormous power and completely turned my mind around. And I didn't wish to attack the attacker in that. I wanted to take their suffering on myself. And so this is a, a radically different way of navigating emotional trauma. But I, I just have to add, in fairness to Dani's very serious question, that this doesn't mean that we've become subservient or, or chronic victims. In fact, if anything, it rescues our capacity to be enlightened activists. I, I, would, I would argue that we become more able to respond uh, in, in an appropriate way. And so anyway, when I asked Keshi Doga, he said uh, it would have been um, cowardly not to have responded in the way that I did. And so sometimes skillful force can be useful in, in a situation of being attacked, but it's not aiming at somehow wiping the other person out with cruelty and, and anger. So it, it comes down to ethics again. How can we be strong and ethical? Yeah. Thank so I'm going to, um, sorry, I might move, move on if that's all right, because I've done a little bit of time, to the qualities of the disciple. And I'm, I'm going to quote uh, Lama Yeshi here from teachings on Vajrapani at Yucca Valley in 1977. Every day, this, um, Lama Yeshi says, in every day, in every moment, underneath everything else, you have the thought, I am this or that kind of person, this or that kind of deluded, impure person. It doesn't matter whether you are religious or non-religious in your attitudes. You all have some kind of ordinary idea of who and what you are. Consciously or unconsciously, you also apply that projection to all other people, to all other sentient beings surrounding you. This mistaken conception pervades everything that you see it characterizes your fundamental neurosis, your basic mental illness. So Lama Yeshi is pulling no, no punches here. He, he's sort of describing the, the foundation of the ground from which we're seeking a teacher. Lama Yeshi goes on, when we practice Guru Yoga, we have a small experience of a unified living image of ourselves and others. Through that experience, by learning the essence of the guru, we can gradually transcend our mundane relationships with others. We can transcend our mistaken and neurotic mental concepts and the atmosphere they create within us and around us. We are surrounded by living beings. We are constantly involved with one another always interacting, relating. Most human problems arise for our interactions with other human beings due to our mistaken ordinary concepts and the vibrations that we project onto others. From our neurotic and agitated state, we tend to view other be beings as ordinary sense objects from which we can gain some kind of sense gratification for our attachments rather than engaging others in any easy way with respect, seeing them positively. And so uh, because 
Lamius is discussing that the tantric practice of Vajrapani, he gives the following example, but we can substitute this with any of our other practices, such as Tara and so forth, the Shakyamuni Buddha and so forth. For example, perhaps it is possible to transcend such an ordinary view by transforming all sentient beings into the form of Vajrapani, so that your mind is automatically engaged, energized, with an attitude of loving kindness and wisdom. In this way, whenever you see another person, your wisdom is energized, bringing greater control and bliss enjoyment into your life. And this is the crunch now. The purpose of practicing guru yoga, says Lama Yeshi, and the yoga method of Vajrapani is to release all the impure, depressed, dissatisfied energy within you by visualizing and actualizing such a transcendental vision. The specific way that we practice the Guru Yoga of Vajrapani, the process of dissolving, sinking, and unifying, enables us to purify the dualistic mind and discover total unity. This is our purpose. Our ordinary existence is rooted in separation. Everything is fragmented because of our mistaken and exaggerated conceptions. This crowded feeling needs to be released. So having such a unified transcendental recognition of ourselves and others as the deity is so important. This is how we train our minds to perceive reality positively without our ordinary agitated negative vibrations. And so Lamiyashi also adds here that mantra has a kind of energy that can also bring our mind into a single pointed closeness away from our usual fragmented and scattered state. So, so this uh, very beautiful uh, quotation was taken from uh, Big Love. Um, it's also it's an excerpt from Big Love. Um, and so I recommend that very strongly, of course, to anyone who's wishing to, to learn about this topic more. So as students, to cut a long story short here, we are seeking to attain a unified, a uni un unified transcendental wisdom of others as the deity, and in this way to cure our diseased minds. So therefore, we could argue that recognizing our current diseased condition is the precondition for opening the precious door to profound transformation away from the afflictions. And so the role of visualizing the deity has this transcendentalizing quality, as Islam Yeshi describes it. It lifts us out of the framework of our strangled ego. And so regarding our guru as inseparable from the deity in, in this way gives us an entirely different way of navigating our, our landscape, our experience. And I find in my own life, um, employing mantras is incredibly powerful when I'm being attacked, for example, getting back to Dhani's very important point, because I substitute my ordinary mind, which is the rah, 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 one, with Om Mani Pami Hung, may all beings be happy, may all beings be free from suffering. And that includes the person who's, who's haranguing me or, or attacking me. And it completely changes, radically transforms the basis of that situation. And so your afflictions have a little chance of arising. And in terms of wisdom, you have a greater capacity to see more clearly how indeed you could respond to that situation in order to benefit and protect that person from harm as well. So um, there's a great, wonderful challenge there. So on page 600 of Big Love, volume one, Lama Yeshi, during his first visit to Lama Tsongkhapa Institute said, answered the question, why do we need a guru? And answered, because in order to cure our diseased minds, we need to the help of someone who knows how to do it. Since it is extremely difficult to understand how the mind works, 
We need the guidance of an expert in this area. Further, gaining liberation or inner freedom is not an easy thing. Everything we have ever said or done on this trip we call life has had its origin in the mind. And in the same way, the entire path to liberation and enlightenment depends on the mind. In order to develop peacefully tranquility of mind, we have to employ a method that brings that result, Lamishi continues. Since we do not know what such methods are or how to put them into practice, we need an experienced teacher to show us what they are. We can say that there are two types of guru, relative and absolute. The absolute guru is the all-knowing wisdom that is one with bliss. That wisdom is the absolute guru. In order to realize this wisdom within ourselves, we need a relative guru to show us how. Therefore, guru doesn't necessarily mean something physical, but beginners who don't possess much inner knowledge definitely need a physical guru. After some time, when we have enough confidence and self-knowledge to travel the path to enlightenment alone, we don't always need to be in the presence of our relative guru, but until that time, we're like yo-yos. When we're around the guru, our mind is subdued, but as soon as we're a mile or two away, our mind goes completely berserk. This shows how we are. Putting it another way, this is Lama Yeshi's conclusion, the guru is the antidote to the confused mind and leads us more uh, and leads us to more con uh, is the antidote to the confused mind as long as they are the right guru. A guru who's a bad influence and leads us to more confusion and restlessness is a false guru, not a guru at all. So are there any uh, thoughts or reflections on, on those passages? Uh, Dr. Moore, I'll, I'll just say uh, slightly to one side, maybe related to what was said about uh, attack. Mm. I think um, these so-called, well, to, the word attack is quite a strong word, but let's say that we are assailed, most of us, mm -hmm almost continuously almost continuously whether it's external or internal mm. one way or another and so um and it's quite extreme i mean in my case i i get physically ill from it mm. and i i saw recently on the internet that the sensors in the brain that are related to emotional pain are actually the same as those, the parts of the brain that experience physical pain. So that, so those, two, those two are very, so there's no, my point there is that there is no, mm, uh, how, how can I say, we cannot, understate the extent of trauma and pain of pretty much just ordinary human life. It's excessively traumatic. Um, and, and, and that's it. So it requires, <laughs> it's a human life, and yet it seems to require superhuman skills just to <laughs> cope. That's my final comment. <laughs> What, what do you say, Doctor? <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I uh, when I was um, diagnosed with a, 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 it's called MDS. It's myelodysplasia. It's a, it's a precursor of leukemia, but it's a terminal condition in its own right. Um, when you get diagnosed with a terminal illness, there's a huge amount of advice given to you. 
And so you're assailed from all sides. And at the end of it, you end up being confused and kind of overwhelmed by all that information, if you like, and all of that concern and commitment. And so I, I went uh, to see Geshe Dover about uh, the situation. He said, relax. And I looked at him and he said, relax. And I looked at him again and he said, relax. And this is something that I, Lama Yeshe Lama Zopa quote as well within the context of, of, of Tantra. And they're saying just to let go and relax and see just to kind of indwell in a relaxed way, which is a form of meditation, of course, simply not to be allow the domination to clutter, simply see through the clutter as if we might be seeing through um, a cloud to the sky on the other side. We just peer through it and just allow the mind to rest. And I find that kind of very fundamental meditation of, of resting, radical resting in this case, because you're not trying to solve anything, uh, gives, equips you when you get up from your cushion to deal with stress in a completely uh, more wholesome, dynamic way. And so it's really a strategy that we need, one that we can employ from moment to moment. And again, I, I, I feel that our mantra play a, a huge role here because if I'm, I'm feeling stressed, I, I, I substitute mantra for my conceptual thought process. And that immediately, effectively dislocates you from the problem. Not through any direct problem solving, but simply that your mind's not engaging it in the same way. And as Lama Yeshi is describing so vividly in that, that really beautiful passage, it, it's because we're not able to project the qualities, the, the bizarre qualities from the ego onto, onto the world and to our experiences that are making them so hard to work with. We're providing a kind of breather. And so they subside in their place as well. So another a bit of advice I got from, from Geshe Doga when I was feeling um, some depression, he said, meditate on the depression. And this is, you know, again, the same radical advice that you don't uh, need to get a solution from outside and then add it on at least in this initial phase of working with it, we can simply allow it to be there. And that stops that antagonistic building up of the problem through combat that, as you describe, is going on all the time. That's a sort of oppositional disorder, isn't it? It can become a really, really big problem for us uh, because we block ourselves off from ourselves at the same time that we block the outer world. So this is sort of just allowing those boundaries to dissolve and so uh, emptiness meditation, of course, is incredibly uh, important and valuable in this regard as well. Because when we uh, get attacked by someone, they seem to be absolutely the enemy in and of themselves coming at us. That's exactly why we're so upset and why we're, we're ra rallied to be so aggressive in response, as Shanti Deva so eloquently describes. But... The reason they're appearing so unattractive to us is because of the projection of unpleasant qualities from the force of our own delusions. That's not to say they're not actually attacking us. They might well be. But the way in which we see the attacker is a projected hallucination. And it's built up in stages. And so if we can interrupt that, process of what we call inappropriate attention in Buddhism. It's that process of building up the hallucination and projecting it outwards and then having it glued to the object so that it appears from its own side to be exactly that horrible thing that we think it is and therefore is worthy of being attacked in return. If we can interrupt that process in an early phase, when we're beginning to see that object as unpleasant, it's interesting, mm. for the mm. first time, the first glimmer of the unpleasantness of the object is the dangerous moment that Shanti Deva describes as the spark in the, in the bed of straw with anger. Mm -hmm. And if we, we can put that little spark out, we've got a chance of preventing the conflagration that's going to burn the entire barn down. 
So it's the same when we begin to feel resentfulness arising as the kind of force substitute mantra on Mani Pami Hung or whatever other practice it's going to visualize a guru and visualize radiant nectars pouring into us into the person in front of us and so forth. So to employ a technique, in other words, to try to intercede. So is this... <laughs> thank yeah. you, Dr. Moore. That's very encouraging. Thank you. I'm very open to other suggestions and advice. Dr. Just... Moore, I have a question. Um, yeah. Okay, that was very helpful. Thank you for that. And thank you, Paula, for asking in that way. Um, it, it was just really opened up uh, my mind to, to hear that. But I would like to ask you about a very specific situation. And that is, and I've asked others about this, but I would like to get your take on it. During the Vietnam War, Buddhist, Buddhist monks were self-immolating mm -hmm. in protest against the violence of that war. And mm. where did their thinking go wrong that led them to do that extreme act of self-sacrifice because obviously there there was no equanimity in that act i mean i don't i don't know how to define it where did their thinking go off track in getting unbalanced to do something like that do you think again it's a very um a difficult question to answer easily i, I would say um, there's a similar situation, unfortunately, with, with uh, young Tibetans um, who have been over, over a number of years burn, burning themselves as a, as a political protest as well. And from a, a Bodhisattva perspective, they will do anything they can to benefit others. And so we, we could argue that those particular Sangha members in the case of the Vietnam War were offering up their lives voluntarily with equanimity and love in order to create a, I use the word advisedly, of course, display, which would then act as a catalyst for bringing about a cessation of the overwhelming violence of the war. And so you, you could argue and I would like to argue that they, they acted out of a, a state of loose, lucid, compassionate self-awareness. And it was based on their understanding of karma and of future rebirths as well. So they're looking at, at, at the fact that they might be uh, terminating the flow of this immediate lifetime, but that there would be another opportunity to practice in the future. And so there are many, many stories in, in the Jataka tales, the life story of, of the Buddha, where the Buddha, for various reasons, offered up his body and, and so forth for, for the benefit of, of others and, and did that without any hesitation, without any fear, through the force of compassion. And so that these are the sorts of the, of, of the capabilities of, of um, bodhisattvas and, and, and you know, very uh, realised spiritual practitioners. So, again, it's difficult uh, to judge from the outside, isn't it, what's going on in, on in their minds um, at that time. But, um, yeah, I don't know what more to say on that, really. Thank you. I appreciate your perspective on that. Yeah. But it does tie in with one, one of our stories, actually. Um, when I say stories, I've got an account here. Uh, regarding uh, the qualities of, of the guru, um, devotion and so forth, um, I'm going to, I'm just jumping ahead here. Two, seven. So, um, Lamas open and other teachers often talk about Sada Pradita as a kind of an exemplary example of a disciple. And in 
the story of, of, of this particular disciple, they did offer up their body uh, because they had nothing else precious to give to give to their teacher. And so I'm going to read from Sankarpa's very beautiful poetic rendition, and I'm going to read for a few pages because it's necessary to uh, get inside the story, which is told so beautifully by Lama Sankarpa. And his, his, his name translates as perpetually weeping. Who is fitting to be my spiritual guide? One who, like a pure lake reflecting the moon, knows perfectly all immeasurable wisdom and who brings samsara to an end. And the disciple here is having a vision of the Buddha talking directly to them. And the Buddha says, night and day, you should follow the great Dharma teacher called sublime wisdom. When you have zealously served, whom you have zealously served in previous ages, always offering worship to him. Perpetually weeping, then awoke from his meditative absorption and not knowing whence the Buddha came and whither they went, became again greatly tormented and upset. Since the son of the victorious one has departed, the moonlight of sadness and the water lily of torment arose together. In the western mountain peak of his mind, however, he thought to himself, later on, I will ask the Lord of speech, sublime wisdom, who is a treasure of endless qualities about these uncertainties in my mind. Then the great Bodhisattva thought to himself, since I'm very poor and do not have things to offer the sublime Bodhisattva, sublime wisdom, such as precious ornaments, garments, gold, silver, pearls, corals, sapphire, lapis lazuli, and things like incense, flowers, garlands, ointments, and frankincense. If I go into the presence of sublime wisdom without such things, it would be highly inappropriate. Keeping closely in his heart this thought of showing respect to his lama, he proceeded gradually on towards a town. In the center of the town, he had a particular thought. Realizing that on the extremely firm golden foundation of self-existence, the ocean of ignorance is churned by the great wind of karma, producing physical and mental components, which are surrounded by the terraces of birth, aging, sickness, and death of the Mount Meru of suffering, pointlessly wander around the ocean of samsara for eons. He, without giving it another thought, resolved to sell his body and with the proceeds make an offering to his spiritual guide. Desiring to do just this, he entered the town. So, Perpetually weeping, went throughout the town, calling over and over, who wants to buy my body? The evil demon, knowing that perpetually weeping was practicing the behavior of exalted uh, bodhisattvas, thought to himself, if his great deeds come to full completion, he will become a supreme captain, skilled in sublime methods. And if by the boat of the excellent path of selflessness, he leads my graters, across the ocean of the three manifestations to the precious island of complete liberation, then I and all my kind will lose total control over our realm and will have nothing to do. Therefore, from now on, I'll create obstacles for him. A small lamp easily dies out, but a powerful forest fire does not. Considering such a thought, the evil demon then stopped others from hearing the great one's cries. So um, the story goes on, but eventually um, the great Bodhisattva does, is ready to give up his body and, and does so. And that sort of uh, sacrifice uh, is a, a very enormous and extraordinary one. And 
Tsongkhapa writes, seeing that without any attachment to even his own body, he was giving his flesh and blood to the Brahmin who desired it. Someone had come and requested his body. His, um, yeah, I, I don't know if I'll, I'll go on with the story um, in detail, but what happens is that he, he offers up his body and then it's miraculously restored and he's told that the entire uh, challenge from the demon and the demon's emissaries was a test to see whether or not he had uh, sufficient guru devotion to meet his teacher. And so there's something quite um, extraordinary here in, in the idea of, of a bodhisattva giving away their body in order to, to meet their spiritual master. So there's a context for this. I'm going to quote from Illuminating the Thought by Tsongkhapa, who says, the generosity of one abiding on the first ground, the first bodhisattva ground, at that point, the first cause of full awakening, the perfection of generosity, will become preeminent, committed to giving away even his very flesh. Giving becomes a sign to infer his unseen qualities. At this point, when the ground of perfect joy is attained, it is the perfection of generosity alone that among the ten perfections becomes preeminent, preeminent for that bodhisattva. On the first ground, the bodhisattva is capable of engaging in such acts as generosity, as giving away his body and external belongings without the slightest glimmer of the attachment or possessiveness that undermines the perfection of generosity. So I think here we have uh, an incredible example of, of generosity. And, and, and it's also, I think, in, in some interesting ways, um, an answer to the question about the Vietnamese monks, because I, I would think that they were also acting out of, of a deep sense of generosity as well. So, so, so um, yeah, I might leave that. So it's a little bit awkward there, but it's it's a very big story and it includes some amazing details about what goes on to do with visions and, and so forth. It's, it's very, very... Um, expansive story and its source is from the perfection of wisdom sutras and in particular the, the middle length redaction of the perfection of wisdom sutras so it's very much a classical example of exemplary guru devotion from the perspective of, of a highly realized bodhisattva so i'm not suggesting that we're in a position to do those things but it, it's i read it out to epitomize the incredibly powerful manner in which the aspiration to be with our teacher can manifest and and uh, help to draw that relationship together there's an element of aspiration involved on our part and that gets back to the point i made in the first week about supplication we can actually supplicate the vision the image of the guru buddha that we've got on our crown and say may through the power of this supplication may i meet my my perfect guru in this life and receive teachings from him or her physically and so forth so it becomes a way of uh, bringing it in into our realm so a, a beautiful example of this kind of of prayer is, is one uh, that's often taught by uh, Kabje Zopa Rinpoche. And on one, at the end of the second Dharma celebration, I, I made my way to um, Dharamsala. And there was no planned uh, activities at, at um, Tashita at that time, but there, much to my delight and amazement, um, arrived uh, to find that Lama Zopa Rinpoche was there, had arrived. And there were a group of students um, who, were, who were also fortunate to be there. And Lama Zoprabhuja sat us down in the, in the little gompa and taught us the traditional chant to this incredibly beautiful moving prayer called Calling the Guru from Afar, which we find uh, on page 75 to 77 of the um, 
FPMT Retreat Prayer Book. But I'm just going to read it aloud. And because we're reaching the end of our session, I'm going to ask us to, to visualize Shakyamuni Buddha, inseparable from our guru on the crown of our head again. And then feel that we're making this request. I'm going to recite it in English. Guru, think of me. Guru, think of me. Guru, think of me. Magnificently glorious Guru, dispelling the darkness of ignorance. Magnificently glorious Guru, revealing the path of liberation. Magnificently glorious Guru, liberating from the waters of samsara. Magnificently glorious Guru, eliminating the diseases of the five poisons. Magnificently glorious Guru, the wish-granting jewel, I beseech you, please bless me. Magnificently glorious Guru, please bless me to remember death and impermanence from my heart. Magnificently glorious Guru, please bless me to generate the thought of no need in my mind. Magnificently glorious Guru, please bless me to abide one pointedly in practice in isolated places. Magnificently glorious Guru, please bless me to not have any hindrances to my practice. Magnificently glorious Guru, please bless me to realize without error the view of the fundamental nature of reality. Magnificently glorious Guru, please bless me so that all bad conditions appear as a support. Magnificently glorious Guru, please bless me to accomplish effortlessly the two works of self and others. Please bless me now quickly. Please bless me quickly, very quickly. Please bless me on this very cushion. Please bless me in this very session. And then Kabjo Zoparumpache uh, suggests we follow this recitation with the following request. May I not give rise to heresy for even a second in regard to the actions of the glorious guru. May I see whatever actions are done as pure. With this devotion, may I receive the guru's blessings in my heart. Magnificent and precious root guru, please abide on the lotus seat at my heart. Gaia be with your great kindness and grant me the realization of your holy body, speech, and mind. And I'm going to recite the third repetition of the, the special supplication verse from Lama Chopa, which I recited twice last week. You are my guru, you are my deities, you are the Dakinis and Dharma protectors. From this moment until enlightenment, I need seek no refuge other than you, in this life, Babado, and all future lives, hold me with your hook of compassion. Free me from samsara and nibbana's fears. Grant all attainments. Be my unfailing friend and guard me from interferences. In this we can absorb the Shakyamuni Buddha, inseparable from our guru, into our hearts. So that's uh, a very, very um, profound practice, of course, and 
calling the guru from afar is uh, a very uh, wonderful way of commencing any uh, retreat that we do because it, it means that we're going to be uh, relying on the, on the guru throughout the entire retreat in order to transform our minds. And so it's really invoking or inviting the guru to, to come and, and support us in that process. But I just thought while reciting the lines, it mentions so that uh, magnif magnificently glorious guru, please bless me so that all bad conditions appear as a support. And I think this really answers uh, the questions that are raised today, because from a Bodhisattva's perspective, when the problem arises, that's the opportunity to practice thought transformation. And so Lama Yeshi and Lama Zopramsha often say that the, when we see an angry person, they are, they are our guru. Seems like a startling idea, doesn't it? That's our guru manifesting as an angry person because if we get angry with them, we've measured the degree of the continual operation of our own capacity to be angry. And that needs to be worked on. And so what kind of guru can manifest in that moment than the one who manifests as someone who is able to provoke us to anger because exactly at that moment we need to do something about our capacity to be angry it means we haven't uprooted the afflictions at all in our mind we've just skated over the surface or created a kind of veneer and so from a low jong of thought transformation perspective all of the problems we have both internal and external are the unique opportunities to do our practice and another uh, little personal story, um, on one occasion um, in Bodh Gaya, um, His Holiness was teaching, and so there were many, many lamas present, including um, Kabja Zopa Rinpoche, and we were doing a group of people, in fact, thousands of people were doing Kora around the great stupa, the Enlightenment stupa. And Kabja Zopa Rinpoche stopped and turned to everyone and said, looked at the stupa and said, think of the stupa as the guru. And as you're circumambulating, make offerings to that for the benefit of all beings. And so I, I found that in, incredibly powerful um, because it, it stopped that tendency we have to exteriorize and sort of like objectify the guru as somehow a magical agency out there and it helps us to understand that any opportunity that we have to practice virtue is a sign, if you like, of the blessing of the guru, because it's on that basis that we're going to be able to, to transform the mind. So Lama Zopramsha in, in Lamp of the Path, Heart of the Path points out that um, no matter what's going on in our search for a guru, it's 100% definite that we can rely on His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, inseparable from Chen Rezi. And so when it all boils down, rely on His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, and, and follow His Holiness, the Dalai Lama's advice. So I find that really, really um, powerful advice, isn't it? So um, we'll, we'll do the dedication. We've only been able to sort of touch the surface in these sessions and I've sort of, uh, you know, it's a huge um, ambition, if you like, to try to, to deal with the content of, of this beautiful book in four little talks. So I've just hoping to stir up a number of, of thoughts and, and contemplations that may be of some benefit. So feel that any of the benefit we've had in our sessions together and our given away the benefit of, of others. May I quickly become Guru Lord Buddha and lead each and every sentient being into his enlightened realm due to these merits. May the precious Bodhi mind that has not, not has, that has not arisen, arise and grow, and may that which has risen never diminish. 
but increase forevermore. May my, may my la venerable Lama's life be firm, his white divine actions spread in the ten directions, and the torch of Lo Seng's teachings always remain, dispelling the darkness of all beings in the three realms. So thank, thank you very much for sharing some time with me. And uh, I hope to see you again. And it's been a, a delight. And uh, I'm going to be uh, taking a keen interest in the program. I, I really admire what the centre is doing in terms of making online uh, content available to to so many people around the world, potentially in the future, of course, because it's all archived. And so there's something very wonderful in that project and uh, it's very inspirational. So I spend a delight to have a little tiny part to play. So thank you. Dr. Moore, thank you so much. I 